Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's program, Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your reader today. To begin the new year of 2023 AD, let us first take a bit of advice from the Bard of Stratford, Mr. William Shakespeare, who wrote these words for the chorus in the opening speech of the play, Henry V. Let us on your imaginary forces work. With that challenge in mind, let me ask you to try to remember that great lyric from the legendary 1960 little musical that ran off Broadway for 42 years and 17,162 performances, the world's longest running musical. Try to remember. Where were you on New Year's Eve in the year 261 BC? <laughs> I must admit that I'm drawing a blank myself, a senior moment. Well, if you were the Roman god Janus, you were seriously celebrating. I feel sure you want to know why. Well, Janus was on the verge of becoming quite famous in the Roman pantheon of gods. A temple of Janus is said to have been consecrated by the consul Caius Duilius in 260 BC after the Battle of Mylae in the Forum Holatorium. I'm sure that's more information than you wanted. But it contained a statue of the god with the right hand showing the number 300 and the left, the number 65, the lengths of days of the solar year. It also contained not one, but 12 altars, one for each month. Now, before we elaborate a tad bit more on the Roman god Janus, let me add a modicum of perspective. Janus was not the only god in the ancient Roman universe. Just how many Roman gods and deities were there, as identified in a supposed, quote, survey constructed by the Romans themselves? As the number grew from the first two, Castor and Polydeuces in 484 BC. The biggest stars in that starry, starry sky back then were, of course, Jupiter, Mars, and Quirinus. Now, tier two included 12 deities. Tier three included 20 deities spearheaded by our man, Janus, but including some very heavy hitters like Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, Apollo, Neptune. Janus was number one. Finally, tier four included 23 deities of the Sabine region in central Italy. So, our man Janus was at spot 16 of the period's greatest hits. 260 BC, alas, a temple to the god Janus was about to open with grand hoopla. Next we ask, what was Janus the god of? to warrant spot 16 out of 58 gods on the roster of Roman deities. In that answer, 
lies the link, finally, to today's book and author in the spotlight. The Roman god Janus was the god of all beginnings, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, and endings. Hmm. All that is rather relatable to New Year's Eve over the past 2,283 years. Janus is always de depicted as having two back-to-back -back faces of seasoned wisdom, one looking into the past and the other with the ability to see into the future. These are profiles back-to-back -back of the same man. Appropriately enough, this month of January is named after the god Janus, or another accepted pronunciation, Janus. The author of today's book succeeds in 313 pages to capture all aspects of the god Janus in a far more contemporary setting of 1962, two years before the publication of her book. This week's queen of doorways, passages, and endings is the American novelist and short story writer, widely known for her psychological thrillers, the inimitable creator of the character Tom Ripley, Patricia Highsmith. And her book in today's reading, the appropriately titled, The Two Faces of January. But before exploring the story told, let us consider some facts about the author. Fort Worth, Texas welcomed Patricia Highsmith to the world in, appropriately enough, January of 1921. Barnard College set the stage for Highsmith's career as a writer, spanning five decades as one of America's most popular authors of suspenseful crime fiction. The, quote, Poet of apprehension, as described by Graham Greene, she claimed that her writing, quote, derived influence from existentialist literature and questioned notions of identity and popular morality, end quote. Following the success of her early short stories, beginning in 1942, Highsmith produced her first novel, Strangers on a Train, in 1950, which was immediately adapted for stage and screen, the best known being the 1951 film directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Indeed, of the many short stories and 22 novels penned by Patricia Highsmith, more than two dozen of her works, almost all of them, have led to film adaptations. Her 1955 novel, The Talented Mr. Ripley, the first of five in a series, was adapted for film multiple times with the most recent and highly successful 1999 movie directed by the brilliant Anthony Minghella, starring Matt Damon, Gwyneth Paltrow, Jude Law, and Kate Blanchett. Highsmith endured cycles of depression, some of them deep throughout her life, Despite literary success, she wrote in her diary of January 1970, I am now cynical, fairly rich, 
lonely, depressed, and totally pessimistic. She famously preferred the company of animals to that of people and stated in a 1991 interview, quote, I choose to live alone because my imagination functions better when I don't have to speak with people. A lifelong diarist, Highsmith left behind 8,000 pages of handwritten notebooks and diaries. Highsmith died in the month following that of Janus on February 4th, 1995 at age 74 from a combination of a plastic anemia and lung cancer at Carita Hospital in Lucerne, Switzerland, near the village where she had lived since 1982. Over the decades of her writing, Patricia Highsmith was honored by numerous organizations, including the French Ministry of Culture, with its esteemed Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres, the Swedish Crime Writers Academy, and the Finnish Crime Society. In 2008, the London Sunday Times recognized her as the greatest crime writer of the 20th century. Patricia Highsmith was also recognized with the prestigious O. Henry Award, the Edgar Allan Poe Award, the, Silo, the Silver Dagger Award, and the Grand Prix de Literature Policière. A final quote from Patricia Highsmith. Our actions and responsibilities are our own. What later returns to either haunt or applaud us is neither possible to predict nor always completely understandable. That quote plays significant presence in today's book. The Two Faces of January. In a grubby Athens hotel, Riddell Keener is bored and killing time with petty crimes. But when he runs into another American, Chester McFarland, dragging a man's body down the hotel hall, Riddell impulsively agrees to help, perhaps because Chester looks like his father. When Riddell meets Colette, Chester's younger wife, he becomes captivated, then becomes entangled in their sordid lives. The drama marches to a shocking climax at the ruins of the labyrinth at Palace of Gnosis, where gates, doorways and passages mix with duality, beginnings, transitions, and especially endings. The Two Faces of January was adapted as a film of the same name in 2014, directed by Hossein Armini, starring Viggo Mortensen, Kirsten Dunst, and Oscar Isaac. It was released during the 64th Berlin International Film Festival. In my humble opinion, <laughs> reading Patricia Highsmith's writing for the first time reminded me of how mind-opening exploring a new genre of writing can be. Though an avid reader, The Two Faces of January was admittedly my first exploration of suspenseful crime fiction. Too many books, too little time. 
I now before you unabashedly admit that it was a most enjoyable reading experience. My mind at all times attempting to fit puzzle pieces together and anticipating new developments. Highsmith tricked me twice. In addition to catching me totally off guard with the ultimate denouement. For one who enjoys the annual New Year's Eve contemplation of time, endings, passages, doorways, and beginnings, I embraced the Roman god Janus while traveling with the machinations of Patricia Highsmith. I now add the two faces of January to my list of recommendations for a good read, especially when you wish to move beyond 1,000 piece puzzles this winter. Let us begin at the very beginning to set the stage for this puzzle of a crime novel. And uh, we shall try to reach uh, three chapters if we're fortunate here in our timeline. So, The Two Faces of January by Patricia Highsmith, reading from chapter one. At half past three of a morning in early January, Chester McFarland was awakened in his berth on the San Geminano by an alarming sound of scraping. He sat up and saw through the porthole a brightly lighted wall of orange-red color extremely close and creeping by. His first thought was, this, was that they were grazing the side of another ship, and he scrambled out of bed and still half asleep, leaned across his wife's berth and looked more closely. There were scribblings and scratches and numbers on the wall, which he now saw was rock. Nico, 1957, he read. W. Mussolini. Then an American-looking Pete. The alarm clock went off. And Chester grabbed for it, knocking over the Scottish bo scotch bottle that stood beside it on the floor. He pressed the button that stopped the alarm, then reached for his robe. Darling, what's going on? Colette asked sheepishly. I think we're in the Corinthian Canal, Chester said, or else we're awfully close to another ship. We're due to be in the canal. It's half past three. Coming on deck? Um, no, Colette murmured, snuggling deeper into the bedclothes. You tell me all about it. Smiling, Chester pressed a kiss into her warm cheek. I'm going on deck. Back in a minute. As soon as he stepped out of the door onto the deck, Chester ran into the officer who told him they would pass through the canal at 3.30 a.m. Si, si, il canale, signora, he said to Chester. Thanks. Chester felt a thrill of adventure and excitement and stood erect against the chill wind, gripping the rail with both hands. There was no one but him on the deck. The canal's sides looked four stories high, at least. Leaning over the rail, Chester saw only blackness at either end of the canal. It was impossible to see just how long it was, but he remembered its length on his map of Greece, one half inch, which he thought would be about four miles. Man made this vital waterway. The thought gave him pleasure. Chester looked at the marks of drills and pickaxes that were still visible in the orangey rock. Or was it hard clay? Chester lifted his eyes to where the side of the canal stopped sharp against the darkness, 
looked higher to the stars sprinkled in the Grecian sky. In just a few hours, he would see Athens. He had an impulse to stay up the rest of the night to get his overcoat and stand on deck while the ship plowed through the Aegean towards Piraeus. He'd be tired tomorrow, however. After a few minutes, Chester went back to the stateroom and crawled into bed. Some five hours later, when the San Gimignano had docked at Piraeus, Chester was pushing his way towards the rail through a grumbling tangle of passengers who had come aboard to assist people with their luggage. Chester had breakfasted in a leisurely way in his stateroom, preferring to wait until the majority of the passengers had debarked, but judging from the number of people on deck and in the corridors, the debarking had not even begun. The town and the deck of Piraeus looked like a dusty mess. Chester had, was disappointed not to be able to see Athens in the hazy distance. He lit a cigarette and looked slowly over the moving and the stationary figures on the broad expanse of dock. Blue-clad porters, a few men in rather sharply looking overcoats, walking from restlessly glancing at the ship. They looked more like money changers or taxi drivers than policemen, Chester thought. His eyes moved from left to right and back again over the entire scene. No, he couldn't believe that any one of the men he saw could be waiting for him. The gangplank was down, and if anyone had come for him, wouldn't he be coming right on board now instead of waiting on the dock? Of course. Chester cleared his throat and took a gentle drag on his cigarette. Then he turned and saw Colette. Greece, she said, smiling. Yes, Greece. He took her hand. Her fingers spread, then closed tightly on his. I'd better see about a porter. All the suitcases closed. She nodded. I saw Alfonso. He'll bring them out. Did you tip him? Mm-hmm. Two thousand lire. You think that's okay? Her dark blue eyes looked up wildly at Chester. Her long auburn lashes blinked twice. Then she repressed a laugh that came bubbling out of a laugh of happiness and affection. You're not thinking. Is 2,000 enough? 2,000 is perfect, darling. Chester kissed her lips quickly. Alfonso emerged with half their luggage, set it on the deck, and went back for the rest. Chester helped him carry it down the gangplank to the dock, and then three or four porters began arguing as to who would get to carry it. Wait, just wait, please, Chester said. Money, you know, got to change some. He waved his traveler's checkbook, then trotted off to a money-changing booth near the gates of the dock. He changed a 20. Please, Colette said, patting a suitcase protectively, and the quarreling porters folded their arms, stepped back, and waited, looking her over with approval. Colette. It was a name she had chosen for herself at the age of 14, in preference to Elizabeth, was 25 years old, five feet three, with reddish light brown hair, full lips, a perfectly straight nose, lightly sprinkled with freckles, and quite arrestingly pretty, dark blue, almost lavender eyes. Her eyes look wildly and straightforwardly at everything and everyone, like the eyes of a curious, intelligent, and still learning child. Men whom she looked at usually felt transfixed and fascinated by her gaze. There was something speculative in it. Falling in love with me, could it be? Most women thought her expression, and even Colette herself, rather naive, too naive to be dangerous, which was fortunate, 
because otherwise women might have been jealous or suspicious of her attractiveness. She had been married to Chester just a little more than a year, and she had met him by answering an advertisement he put in the Times for a part-time secretary and typist. It hadn't taken her more than two days to realize that Chester's business was not exactly on the up and up. What stockbroker operated out of his apartment instead of an office? And where were his stocks on the exchange anyway? But Chester had a lot of charm. He plainly had plenty of money, and evidently the money was rolling in steadily, which meant he wasn't in any trouble. Chester had been married before for eight years to a woman who had died of cancer two years before Colette met him. Chester was 42 still handsome, graying slightly at the temples, and just a bit inclined to develop a tummy. But Colette was inclined to put weight on all over, and dieting was a normal thing with her. It was easy for her to plan menus that were appetizing, as well as low in calories. Here we go, Chester said, waving a fistful of drachma notes. Pick a taxi, honey. There were half a dozen taxis standing about, and Colette chose the one of a driver who had a friendly smile. Three porters helped them load the taxi with their seven pieces of luggage, two of which went on the roof, and then they were off for Athens. Chester, Chester set forward, watching for the Parthenon on its hill, or some other landmark that might appear against the pale blue sky. And then he found himself looking at an imaginary walkie cat, big as all Athens, red and chromium with its horrible rubber lumped handlebars and its ugly cupped safety seat. Chester shuddered. What a stupidity, what a needless idiotic task that had been. Colette had told him so too. She had got a bit angry when she found out about it, and she was perfectly justified in getting angry. The walkie cat had come about like this. In a printer's shop where he was having some business cards made, Chester had noticed a stack of handbills advertising the walkie cat. There was a picture of it, a description, and the price, $12.95. And at the bottom, an order blank that could be torn off along a perforated line. The printer had laughed when Charles Chester picked up one of the sheets and looked at it. The company was out of business, the printer said, and they hadn't even paid him for the print job. No, the print wouldn't have minded at all if Chester took a few of them, because he was going to throw them out anyway. Chester had said he wanted to send them to a few of his friends as a joke, his heavy drinking friends. And at first he had wanted to do that only. And then something, temptation, bravado, a sense of humor, had compelled him to try peddling the damaged things. And by ringing doorbells and making with the old spiel, he had sold more than $800 worth, mainly to people in the Bronx. Then he had run into one of his purchases in his own apartment building in Manhattan, and moreover, just as he was opening his own mailbox. The man said his walkie car had not arrived, though he had ordered and paid for it two months ago, and neither had the walkie car of a neighbor of his arrived. When that happened to two people who knew each other, they got together and did something about it. Chester knew from experience, and since the man had taken a good look at his name on the mailbox, Chester had thought it just as well to get out of the country for a while, rather than move to another apartment and change his name to something else again. Colette had been wanting to go to Europe, and they had planned to go in spring, but the walkie car incident had hurried them up by four months. They had left New York in December. Yes, 
Colette had reproached him pretty severely for the walkie car episode, and she had been annoyed also because she thought the weather wouldn't be as pleasant in winter as in spring, and she was right, of course. Chester had given her a new set of luggage and a mink jacket by way of making it up to her, and he wanted to do everything he could to make the trip a happy one for her. It was Colette's first trip to Europe, so far, she had liked London best, and, to Chester's surprise, liked London more than Paris. It had rained more in Paris than in London. Chester had caught a cold, and he remembered that every time he got his feet wet or felt rain sliding down the back of his neck, he had thought of the damned walkie car, and he had reminded himself of that for the wretched bit of money he had got out of it, he might have caused, might still cause, Howard, Ch Howard Cheever, which was his current alias, and the name that had been on his mailbox in the New York apartment building, to be exposed to a thoroughly investigation, and could mean the end of half a dozen companies on whose stock sales Chester depended for his living. Europe was safe, safer than the States just now. And Chester McFarlane, his real name, was a name he hadn't used in 15 years. But he was guilty, among other things, of defrauding through the mails, which was one of the few offenses the American government could extradite a man for. It was remotely possible that they would send a man over after him. Chester thought if they ever made the connection between Cheever and McFarland. The taxi driver asked him something over his shoulder in Greek. Oh, sorry, no capiche, Chester answered. The, the main square, okay, uh, the center of town. Grande Bretagne, asked the driver. Uh, well, well, I'm not sure, sure, quite sure, but Chester said. The Grand Britannia was unquestionably the biggest and best hotel in Athens, but for that very reason, Chester felt wary about stopping there. Let's take a look, he added, though he didn't think the driver understood. There it is, he said to Colette, that white building over there. The white edifice of the Grand Britannia had a formal antiseptic air in contrast to the less tall and dirtier buildings and stores that stood around the rectangle of Constitution Square. There was a government building of some sort far to the right, a Greek flag flying from a pole on its grounds, and a couple of soldiers in skirts and white stockings standing guard near the doors. What about that hotel, Chester asked, pointing, the King's Palace, that looks pretty good, don't you think, honey? Okay, sure, Colette said agreeably. The King's Palace Hotel was across a street at one side of the Grand Bretagne. A bellboy in a red jacket and black trousers came out of the pavement to help with the luggage. The lobby looked first rate to Chester, maybe not luxury class, but first rate. The carpet was thick underfoot, and judging from the warmth, the central heating really worked. You have a reservation, sir? asked the clerk behind the counter. No, no, we haven't, but we'd like a room with a bath and a nice view, Chester said, smiling. Oh, yes, sir. The clerk pushed a bell and then handed a key to the uniformed boy who came up. Show them 621, please. Uh, may I have your passport, sir? You can pick them up when you come down. Chester took the one that Colette drew from her red leather case in her pocketbook, pulled his own from his inside breast pocket, and pushed them across the counter to the clerk. It always gave him a little throb of mental pain, a small shock of embarrassment, such as he felt when a doctor asked him to strip whenever he pushed his passport over a hotel counter or had taken it from his hand by an official inspector. Chester Crichton McFarland, 
Five feet 11, born in 1922 in Sacramento, California. No distinguishing marks. Wife, Elizabeth Talbot McFarland. It was all so naked. Worst of all, his photograph, so untypically for a passport photograph, was a very good likeness, showing receding brown hair, aggressive jaw, good-sized nose, rather stubborn, thin-lipped mouth with a moustache above it. An excellent portrait of him, depicting all but the color of his blue staring eyes and the ruddiness of his cheeks. Had the clerk, Chester always thought, or the inspector been shown the same picture of him and told to keep his eyes open for him, this moment at the King's Palace Hotel was not the time to learn because the clerk pushed the passports to one side without opening them. A few minutes later, they were comfortably installed in a large warm room with a view of the white geranium garnished balconies of the Grand Britannia and of a busy avenue six stories down, which Chester identified on his map of Athens as Venizelo Street. It was only 10 o'clock. The whole day lay before them. Chapter two. At that moment, in a considerably cheaper and shabbier hotel around the corner on Kreitzotu Street, sometimes called Jan Smuts Street, a young American named Riddell Keener was pressing the button for an elevator on the fourth floor. He was a slender, dark-haired young man, quiet and slow in movement. There was an air of melancholy about him. Melancholy turned outward rather than inward, as if he brooded not on his own problems, but the world's. His dark eyes seemed to see and to think about whatever they looked at. He appeared also very poised, not at all concerned with what anybody thought of him. His insouciance was often taken for arrogance. It did not go with the worn shoes and overcoat he had on now, but his bearing was so confident that his clothes were the last thing people noticed about him, if they noticed them at all. It was an even bet every morning whether the elevator would come or not. And every morning, Riddell played a game with himself. If the elevator came, he would have breakfast at the Taverna Dionosio in Nico Street. And if it didn't come, he would buy a newspaper and have breakfast in the Café Brazil. Not that it made a bit of difference one way or the other. He would buy four newspapers anyway. In the course of the day, but the Taverna Dionosio, he knew so many people. He was always talking too much to read anything. And then the Cafe Brazil, a fancier place, he never knew anyone. And he always took a newspaper with him for company. Riddell would wait patiently, walking in a slowed circle over the threadbare carpet in front of the elevator shaft. No annunciatory rattle from below or above showed that anyone had heard or heeded his ring. Riddell sighed, threw his shoulders back, and stared with serious attention at an extremely dark and obscure painting of a country landscape that hung on the wall of the corridor he had just walked through. Even the sky was a sooty black, as if the picture, Surely no artist in the world, however bad, would paint a hillside and sky so smutty you could scarcely see where one ended and the other began, had over the years accumulated the dirt of the atmosphere, absorbed the very breaths of the Greek, French, Italian, Serbian, Yugoslavian, Russian, American, and whatever people that had passed back and forth in that corridor. Two sheep's backsides, dingy tan, were the brightest spots in the composition. The elevator was certainly not coming. He might have rung again, could eventually have got service if he kept ringing, but his game was over, and he no longer cared to ride. 
He would go to the Café Brazil. Riddell walked slowly down the first short flight of carpeted stairs. There were two holes, each the size of a large foot in the carpet, and Riddell wondered if anybody had ever tripped in them and fallen. They would have fallen against a cement vase, phony, 3rd century B.C., which stood on a Victorian flower stand of cast iron. Riddell went by a mirror some 10 feet long on the wall, crossed a small, meaningless foyer where there was another opaque painting and a pot of dried-out ferns, and took some stairs that led down in another direction. On the next floor, a tall and somewhat angular woman in tweeds, not a bit masculine, but flat and sexless as something out of a 1920 British fashion drawing, pressed the elevator button with a confident air, then returned Riddell's gaze with calm, greenish eyes. Riddell's eyes lingered on hers a little too long for the look to be merely one that one gives a stranger encountered in a hotel hall. But that was another game Riddell played. And the hotel make your condilis was just the place to play it. The game might be called adventure. It depended on meeting the right person, male or female. Something would take place when his eyes met the eyes of the right person. There would be a shock of recognition. One of them would speak. They would have some kind of adventure together, or there wouldn't be anything in the eyes, and absolutely nothing would happen. This woman was certainly an odd and fascinating type, but nothing really happened in her eyes. The Hotel Melchior Condilis was full of odd and fascinating-looking people. It was not a place for the well-heeled, nor a place the average American would be drawn to, but it had almost every other nationality staying in it, as far as Riddell could see. There was an East Indian couple now and an elderly French couple. There was a young Russian student whom Riddell had tried chatting with in Russian, but the Russian acted as if he was suspicious of him, and their acquaintance had not progressed. Last month, there had been an Eskimo traveling with an American oceanographer, and they were both natives of Alaska. There was the predictable sprinkling of Turks and Yugoslavs. It was amazing to think of little points all over the world where people who had been to the Melchior Condilis would mention its name in one or the other of 25 or 30 languages and perhaps recommend it, or could they really, except for its cheapness, to their friends as a place to stop in Athens. The service was awful worse than non-existence, because it was often promised when it did not come. The corridors and stairs of the place had, to Riddell, the anticipatory air of a stage when all the props are in place and before the first actor makes his appearance. Not one item in the room, Riddell had been in three of them, the corridors or the lobby was wrong for its character and its character was that of an old, tired, Mintel Europa staple back. Riddell found the elevator operator, who also doubled as porter, reading a newspaper on the wooden bench by the door and picking his nose. Good morning, Mr. Keener, said Max, a black mustached man in an ancient gray uniform behind the desk. Morning to you, Max, how are you? Riddell laid his key down. You want lottery ticket? Max asked with a hopeful grin, holding up a sheet of tickets. Um, I'm, am I feeling lucky today? Not particularly. Not today, Riddell said, and went out. He turned left and walked towards Constitution Square and the American Express office. There might be a letter for him at the American Express, there most likely was a letter, because this was Wednesday, and it had no mail Monday or Tuesday, and he averaged two letters a week. <laughs> but he decided to wait until afternoon before, go before going in to ask. He bought yesterday's run London Daily Express, 
and the Athens newspaper of this morning gave a wave to Nico, who was shuffling about in his gym shoes a half few yards away on the pavement in front of the American Express Travel Agency, his figure beige and more or less round under the sponges that hung on strings all over him. Lottery, Nico yelled, swinging up at lottery sheet. Riddell shook his head. No, not today, he yelled back in Greek. It was evidently a great day for lottery tickets. Excuse me. Riddell went into the Café Brasil, climbed the stairs to the second floor bar, where one could also get breakfast, and ordered a cappuccino with a jelly donut. The news in the paper was dull today. A small train wreck in Italy, a divorce case against an MP, Riddell rather enjoyed murder stories, and he liked the English best. He smoked three papistratos after his coffee, and it was getting on to 11 when he went out. He thought he would drop by the National Archaeological Museum for a little while, then buy a present for Pan. Pan's birthday was Saturday, and he was giving a party in some haberdashery or leather shop in Stadio Street, having lunch in the hotel restaurant, then work on his poems and what was left of the afternoon. Pan had said something about going to a movie tonight, but the date might not come off, and Riddell didn't care if it didn't. It was obviously going to rain, and the Athens paper predicted it also. Riddell enjoyed loafing in his room and working on his poems when it rained. Out on the pavement, he was inspired to call at the American Express now instead of in the afternoon, so he walked through the arcade that brought him out on another street more or less parallel to Constitution Square, where the American Express mail office was located. There was a letter from his sister, Martha, in Washington, D.C. Another slight reproach, Riddell supposed, but it wasn't. It was actually almost an apology to him for having, quote, spoken a little sharply in December. She had written, not spoken. Riddell's father had died in early December. Riddell had been notified by a cable from his brother, Kenny, two days before the funeral. He could have flown home, but he didn't. His father had suffered a heart attack and died within four hours. Riddell had delayed undecided for 24 hours and had finally wired Kenny in Cambridge that he was sorry to hear the news and that he sent him and the rest of the family his love and sympathy. He did not say he was not coming, but that was evident since him, since Martha had, and she had said, considering the family is so small, just you and I and Kenny and his wife and children, I think you might have made an effort to get here. After all, he was your father. I can't believe that your conscience doesn't bother you. Are you going to nurse a grievance even after the object is dead? You would be happier, Riddell, if you could be bigger about it, and if you'd come and stood by with the rest of us. Riddell remembered the letter almost verbatim, though he had thrown it away as soon as he had read it. Now his sister wrote that she understood that he had his grievances. Quote, which... As you know, I've always considered rather warrantable, but don't be bitter if you can help it. You once told me you understood the uselessness of hatred and resentment. I hope it's true now more than ever, and that you're finding some kind of peace over there. Somehow I like the idea of your being in Athens rather than Rome. When do you think you'll be coming home? Riddell refolded the letter and pushed it into his overcoat pocket. Then he walked out of the American Express office and turned in the direction of the arcade again. He was not going to be in Athens much longer. The right day would come, and he would take the plane for Crete, having a look at the Palace of Gnosis and the Heraclean Museum of Cretan Antiquities, and then fly home.
Then he would see about getting a job in a law firm, he supposed, uh, in New York. He had about $800 left in traveler's checks and a little cash. His money had held out quite nicely over the two years he had been away. His dear grandmother's 10000 His grandmother had been the only one in the family who had believed in him at the time of the crisis with his father. She had made her will then and had died when Riddell was 23, midway in his year of army service. He had made up his mind then what he was going to do with it. Go to Europe and stay as long as it lasted. His father had wanted him to get started right away in a law firm and even had a position in a junior capacity arranged for him with Wheeler, Hooten and Clive on Madison Avenue. His father had known Wheeler. But Riddell hadn't and didn't want to start work with any firm that had any connection with his father. You're late enough, said his father, mostly in regard to his not getting out of Yale Law School until he was 22, so unlike the precariousness and scholarly keeners. But his father sending him to reform school for two years hadn't helped, and he had not entered Yale until he was 19. His father had graduated from Harvard at 19, Kenny at 20, Martha from Radcliffe at 20 also, all Phi Beta Kappa. Riddell was no Phi Beta Kappa. Riddell found himself standing in front of the Cafe Brazil's glass doors in the arcade, awoke to the present, and remembered he had just been there, then went on through the arcade in search of Nico. Yes, he'd buy a couple of lottery tickets today, after all. There was Nico, still shuffling and stomping in the coal in his gym shoes. Nico had bunions, and sneakers were the only kind of shoes he felt comfortable in. Riddell smiled as he watched Nico approach well-dressed gentlemen just emerging from the American Express. Lottery tickets or sponges? Which would you like, sir? Then Riddell came to a stop. The man talking to Nico looked remarkably like his father. The blue eyes were the same, the jutting nose, the color of the mustache. This man was about 40, heavier and ruddier. But the resemblance was so outstanding, Riddell had an impulse to ask the man if they were related, if his name were possibly Keener. The Keeners had some... English cousins, and this man would be English, but his clothes looked American. The man put his head back and laughed, a hearty laugh that carried to Riddell and made him smile too. Nico's hand jerked back under the sponges, but Riddell had seen a white flash that might have been pearls on his palm. The ruddy-faced man in the dark overcoat had declined whatever Nico had offered, but was buying a sponge. Riddell folded his arms and waited quietly near the newspaper kiosk on the corner. He saw the man push a second bill into Nico's, but unwilling hand, saw him wave and heard him call so long as he waved away. He was walking towards Riddell. Riddell kept looking at him, seeing, even in his walk, his father's confident stride. The sponge bulged his overcoat pocket. In his left hand, he carried a new-looking guide blue. He glanced at Riddell, looked away, then looked again, walking past him, but turning his head so as to keep in view. Riddell stared back, and it was no game now. He was not waiting for a sign. He was simply fascinated spellbound by the man's resemblance to his father. The man at last looked away from Riddell, and Riddell followed him, walking at a slower pace. The man glanced over his shoulder at Riddell, hurried his steps, ran off the curb at Venizelo Street, then slowed at the wrong place in front of an oncoming car, as if trying to give the impression he was not hurrying. Now he had passed the Grand Bretagne, and Riddell had expected him to turn in there. 
Rodol kept him in view, but already his interest was flagging. What if he were an English cousin? Who cared? The man went into the King's Palace Hotel, whose front door was set at an angle on the corner, and he looked back, Riddell couldn't tell if he saw him or not, before he went in. It was that last looking back that mused Riddell's suspicion. What was the man afraid of? What was he running from? Riddell walked slowly back to Nico and bought two lottery tickets. Who is your friend? Riddell asked. Who? asked Nico, grinning and smiling, showing his lead-framed front tooth next to a gap. The American who just bought a sponge, Riddell said. Oh, I don't know. Never saw him before this morning. Nice guy. Gave me extra 20 drags. Nico shifted and the sponges swayed. The broad, dirty white gym shoes, all that was visible of him below the panoply of sponges, did slow ups and downs like the feet of a restless elephant. <laughs> Why, you ask? Oh, I don't know, said Riddell. Plenty letters, said Nico. Riddell smiled. He had taught Nico the work, word letters and a lot of other slang words for money a subject Nico was very interested in. But you couldn't get rid of the hot stuff to him. Read, asked Nico, puzzled. Nico knew hot stuff, but not rid. Couldn't sell him any jewelry? Ah, Nico waved a barely visible hand among the sponges, laughing with a sudden and our character uncharacteristic embarrassment. You think it over, he say. What was it? Pearls. After a glance to either side of him, Nico pulled a hand out and displayed a circle of pearls, a two-row bracelet on his wide, soiled palm. Riddell nodded and the pearls disappeared again. How much? To you, four hundred pounds. Ugh, Riddell said automatically, though they were worth it. Well, good luck with the rich American. He'll be back said Nico. And Nico was probably right, Riddell thought. Nico had been a fence or a messenger for fences since childhood, and he could size people up. Then Riddell realized that there had been something vaguely dishonest looking about the ruddy American. Even in the few seconds Riddell had seen him talking to Nico, Riddell could not quite say what it was. At first glance, it looked like a jolly, talkative type open as a child. But he certainly had a furtive manner as he walked towards the hotel. The man probably would come back and buy the bracelet from Nico, and what honest or even reasonably cautious person would buy real pearls from a street peddler of sponges? Perhaps the man was a gambler, Riddell thought. It was a funny incongruity to look so much like his father. Professor Lawrence Aldington Keener of the Department of Archaeology at Harvard, who had never dreamt of doing anything faintly illegal, a veritable pillar of respectability, and to be possibly a gambler, a crook of some sort. It was three days before Riddell saw the ruddy American again. Riddell had forgotten about him, or, if he had thought of him once in that time, had supposed he had moved on somewhere. And then one noon, Riddell ran into him at the Benaki Museum among the costume exhibits. He was with a woman, a young and quite chic American woman, almost but not quite too young to look like the man's wife. From the way the men solicitously and affectionately touched her elbow now and then, the good-natured way he strolled about and chatted with her as she looked with obvious pleasure at the embroidered skirts and blouses on the glass-enclosed dummies, Riddell thought that they were either married pretty recently or were lovers. The man carried his hat in his hand, and Riddell could see the shape of his head now. 
high at the back like his father's head, the hair above his temples receding as his father's hair had receded, like an ebbing tide following the contour of a shore. His voice was deep and resonant, a bit more taut than his father's. He chuckled easily. Then, after perhaps five minutes, the woman looked directly at Riddell, and Riddell's heart stopped for an instant, then beat faster. Riddell blinked and looked away from her, but looked at the man who, seeing him, frowned slightly, his lips parted in surprise. Riddell turned, slowly walked to a case full of jeweled scimitars and daggers, and bent over it. Less than a minute later, the man and woman were gone. The man sought, certainly thought he was trailing him, watching him. Riddell thought it made the man uneasy, and Riddell had an impulse to go to the King's Palace Hotel, wait for him, just to assure him he meant him no harm, and that he wasn't and hadn't been shadowing him. Then, after that struck him as, after all, uncalled for and a bit silly, and Riddell decided to do nothing about it. Riddell walked slowly out of the museum, feeling suddenly lonely, sad, and vaguely discouraged. He knew now what had struck him about the young woman, but it was irritating and disturbing that her heart had known what that his heart had known before his brain or his memory. She had the same sexy come hitherness, the same soft, plumpish charm that his cousin Agnes had had at 15. Son of a gun, Rodell whispered as he walked down a broad avenue. Son of a gun to no one and with no one in particular in mind. The woman had blue eyes anyway, and Agnes's were brown. Agnes's hair was dark brown and this woman's was reddish. But there was something. What was it? The mouth? Yes, a little bit. But most of all, just the expression in the eyes, he thought. He hadn't fallen for it since, Riddell assured himself. But had he seen it since? No, he hadn't. Well, it was a funny thing. A man who looked like his father's twin brother, in the company of a woman who had called up Agnes to him, straight and fast as a light turned on in his face, or a knife that laid his heart wide open. It had been ten whole years ago. He had been fifteen. So much had happened in the ten years since. Now he was supposed to be a mature man. He remembered Proust's remark that people do not grow emotionally. It was a rather frightening thought. That night, the night of Pan's party in his family's house over by Hadrian's library, Riddell drank a few more glasses of ouzo than he needed and found himself thinking of the ruddy-faced American, his father, 20 years ago, making love in bed to the plump woman whose reddish hair and blue eyes kept changing to Agnes's brown hair and brown eyes. But the soft red lips were the same. Riddell was inclined to be ill-tempered at the party. He tried to be very careful in the last hour to make up for a cutting remark he had made to Penn's girlfriend. The next morning, with a slight hangover, he wrote a four-line poem about the marble ghost of his boyhood love. Monday, he went by bus for the fifth and sixth time to Delphi and spent the day. The memory of the pink-cheeked American and his bedable wife still nagged at him. He was exaggerating the resemblance. He was sure, especially the resemblance of the woman to Agnes. He decided that he should see them once more, look at them straight on from a distance or just a few feet, and he felt that something would happen. The spell would be broken, the illusion dispelled. 
If he asked their hotel clerk, he could find out that they were Mr. and Mrs. Johnson from Vincennes, Indiana, or Mr. and Mrs. Smith of St. Petersburg, Florida. They would never have heard of anybody named Keener. I think we shall end there. We've certainly met the three key characters of the book. Um, husband and a young, much younger wife by nearly 20 years, and a young American just toward the end of his two years in Europe, uh, using the money from his grandmother's will. Uh, there's obviously suspicion raised in these first two chapters. Uh, the older gentleman seems to be aware of people following him and suspects Keener right away. And Keener, not only because the man looks like his father, who it seems he quite hated, uh, but also he's taken by the suspiciousness of the old man. The next chapter brings us into the uh, body being hauled down the hallway and thus begins the caper, really. We quickly discover that the man is dead and that the elder gentleman is the one who killed him. And somehow Kina falls into helping him. <laughs> I shan't say more. A good crime novel. I shouldn't give away anything, let alone what I've just done. <laughs> I hope you got the sense of it. Uh, uh, the, the sense of being in a foreign land. Foreigners in a foreign land always uh, sort of peaked uh, to everything going on around them. And then suddenly the eyes, the connections, the non-connections, um, the sponge seller with pearls, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? <laughs> and wearing the grubby gym shoes. Anyway, we met the characters. <clears throat> the crime is set up, the first part, the crime anyway. And uh, the real joy of the novel comes when they get to Gnosis, the, the palace at Gnosis, which has the famous labyrinth. And I counted in the chapters about that section of the book, I counted the use of doorways 28 times. <laughs> so uh, certainly Miss Highsmith is very aware of uh, the god Janus and doorways comes up all the time or portals or gates. Um, so it's quite interesting. She certainly has her finger on the pulse there. I hope you'll read the rest of it. It's a, it's a short read. And the denouement, I understand from friends, the denouement is meant to surprise you in most cases and to outguess you. And I must admit, in this book, I was outguessed. <laughs> so I'll leave you with that. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about next week's book. We're going to take a, a 180, actually, from a crime fiction. We're going to go to science for a bit. We received a comment in the comments section on uh, YouTube um, that we had not hit science very much before. As a matter of fact, out of the 108 programs that I've done, I think we've done science only once. So we're going to go to science uh, next week. Uh, with a book that has a great title, it certainly draws your attention. It's called Divine Wind. Divine Wind. Now the subtitle gives more of it away. The History and Science of Hurricanes. Now certainly Mother Nature is not happy these days, as we all know. And hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis, etc., etc., and even enormous rainstorms, uh, happening very, very frequently, is that the future of the planet Earth? Well, we shan't answer that one. We'll leave that one up in the air. But uh, let's take a book and let's take a look at Hurricanes by Dr. Kerry Emanuel. Imagine standing at the center of a Roman Colosseum that is 20 miles across with walls that soar 10 miles into the sky, towering walls with cascades of ice crystals following along its brilliantly white surface. That's what it's like to stand in the eye of a hurricane. In divine wind, 
end, says the publisher, Carrie Emanuel, one of the world's leading authorities on hurricanes, gives us an engaging account of these awe-inspiring meteorological events revealing how hurricanes and typhoons have literally altered human history. Thwarting military incursions and changing the course of explorations. Interwoven with this scientific account are descriptions of some of the most important hurricanes in history and relevant works of art and literature. For instance, he describes the 17th century hurricane that likely inspired Shakespeare's The Tempest and that led to the British colonization of Bermuda. So not just scientific words in this book, a great lot of connections. Dr. Emmanuel, an internationally prominent meteorologist and climate scientist, is Professor Emeritus at Atmospheric Science at MIT, his alma mater. He was named one of Time 100 Influential People of 2006. In 2007, he was elected as a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, in 2019, a member of the American Philosophical Society, and in 2020, a foreign member of the Royal Society, of which I happen to know there are very few. Anyway, I hope you'll join me next week. It sounds very exciting, and yet uh, tying in all things artistic to all things scientific. We'll be ready for the next hurricane. At least we'll have lots of information to share it a worrisome cocktail party about what the weather's going to be. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video today and the story, I hope you'll give us a thumbs up with that icon just below the screen. Uh, maybe you'd even consider sharing it with a friend who you think might find it interesting or even a Patricia Highsmith fan. Also, uh, please do leave a comment about the author, the book, the reading, or leave the name of one of your favorite books for us to consider for future readings. That would be great. I also encourage you to subscribe to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel. The word subscribe appears right there as well. It's to stay on top of all of the great content in the program's department at the library. And to keep us in the number one spot statewide as the public library with the most YouTube channel subscribers, even more than some of the bigger libraries in our state. So please press the button, it doesn't cost anything and it would be great for us. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed being with me today and I hope you'll join me next week for some fascinating information about hurricanes and their effect on many things over the years. Happy New Year to all of you, and may the new year be filled with chuckles, good wine, and lots of good health. Take care of yourself. Goodbye.